this we're talking about right now is this guy. Resolved in the United States, juveniles charged with violent felonies ought to be treated as adults in the criminal justice system. So it's kind of a mouthful. But we know it, kind of know some of the vague ideas about what it means. But let's talk about a few key definitions. The first thing is juveniles. So juveniles are someone under the age of 21. Now, most states treat people who are under 18 as juveniles, but legally, people under 21 are all juveniles. So basically, kind of to think about juvenile, think about being under the drinking age. So that's kind of the vague, like the broad definition of who a juvenile is. I mean, it kind of, we kind of think of it as being under 18 normally, but it's for like a broad definition, and that might actually help us, especially on the affirmative, because if you think about like a 20-year-old who does something that's a violent mm -hmm. felony, then it's going to be really hard for the negative to say, oh, that person should be treated as like a 13-year-old. And so that yeah, might help with the affirmative. Um, another thing that's important is the resolution talks about being charged with a violent felony. And I think it's important to remember that being charged is not the same as being convicted. And so the prosecutor or district attorney, and that's the person who's actually deciding whether or not to charge somebody. What is the difference? And so being charged just means you have enough evidence to say, we think this person did it. But to be convicted actually means that you go before the judge and the judge says, and the judge and the jury actually convict the person and then they actually go to prison or something like that. Oh, so charges is the, like, before the official announcement? Exactly. Like, the yeah, and so, you know, when they come and arrest somebody, that's when the person's been charged, charged. with the crime, okay. but they haven't actually guilty. We still think that people are innocent enough. until proven guilty. Right. And so, we just have to remember, so the individual who's charged isn't necessarily a criminal. Like, they might be, but the legal system hasn't necessarily said whether they are or not. Okay. Now, violent felonies, we talked about this the other day. Felonies aren't really a category of crimes other than just a one year in jail or a large enough fine. That's kind of the dividing line on felonies. Um, it's the violence aspect of a felony is something that might actually matter with this resolution because we actually, when we were trying to talk and brainstorm a little bit, violence was a hard thing to try to figure out. Mm -hmm. Does violence mean that we're talking about actual physical murders and rapes and things that are physical, I grab onto someone and I hurt them, like a battery? Or is it a threat of force? So this could be things like robbery, assault, which assault is when you just like yell a threatening thing at somebody. Mm -hmm. And so that probably, that could potentially be a violent felony, but maybe it's not. And so the definition isn't necessarily clear. Exactly. And so you've been charged with a violent felony. So this, this, kind, this part of the resolution might actually be where a lot of the game gets played. Because you're trying to figure out how harsh do we want to be on somebody who's charged with one of these things. Another way that we might define violent is whether or not somebody's using a weapon in the course of committing the crime. Or in the course of doing the action. And so, but even using a weapon isn't necessarily clear. Because using a gun might be very different than using a knife or than showing something like a club. Like the, all those things are very different, and those might have very different implications for whether the person's really being violent. Mm -hmm. And then another type of thing an affirmative might want to do, they might want to extend violent felonies all the way to things that have the tendency to create or to be surrounded by violence. So this is like gang activity. So it might even be drug dealing, it might be tagging, so when gangs graffiti things, like people might want to try to extend the resolution all the way to that because they say, well look, if somebody's involved in all this gang related activity, then the likelihood is they're going to be involved in other violent things. That's a really big stretch, at least to me, but those are the sort of things that people might talk about. Okay. Then treated. So the National Center for Policy Analysis has what's called Debate Central as a website, and they did a summary of the resolution. And one of the things they pointed out was the word treated isn't necessarily a real clear word. It, in 2006, they had a very similar resolution to the one that we're debating, and that one specifically said tried and punished as an adult, whereas we're talking about treating them as adults. Mm -hmm. And so does that mean some sort of a medical term? Does that mean that the whole system should treat them like an adult, only the part that's charging them should treat them like an adult, what exactly does treated mean? And so that could matter as we're defining this resolution. And finally, the last phrase, adults in the criminal justice system. So adults in the criminal justice system looks kind of like what we're used to on TV when we watch Law & Order or when we watch CSI, any of those sort of things. 
So an individual gets arrested because the district attorney or prosecutor has enough evidence to arrest them. So they find, you know, a shoe that the person owns that that left a shoe print at the scene of the crime. That person also owns the car that everybody thinks was the getaway car. So then they arrest the person. Once they've gathered enough evidence, then the prosecutor decides, okay, I have enough evidence to actually charge this person with the crime. After you charge an individual, then you're probably going to have a meeting with the prosecutor, the district attorney, and the individual and, the ind and his or her lawyer. And you're going to have a plea bargain discussion. And the whole idea of the plea bargain is to try to get cases out of the legal system faster. And so the person's going to admit that they committed that or maybe some lesser crime, get less punishment, and the prosecutor doesn't have to worry about whether or not the jury is going to convict. Okay. Our cases could fall into that category. So the plea bargain world, you could be treated like an adult by it, when you're charged, just in how plea bargain discussions happen. If the person is decides not to take the plea bargain and wants to go to trial, so the person who's charged with the crime wants to go to trial, then in that situation, the prosecutor will most likely put the person in, into jail. And we talked about the distinction between jail and prison the other day. So jail's where you go when you are waiting for, being, waiting for your trial. And then if you are convicted, then you're sent to prison. And so they'll go to jail unless they can bail themselves out or they have someone else who can bail them out. So jail is like the pre, like the pre before exactly. you actually that's right, yeah. You go to jail, if you get convicted, then you end up in prison. So the goal, obviously, of the person who decides not to take the plea bargain is to not go to prison. Take the jail time and then hopefully get out and have the jury say they're not guilty. So and what happens if the, uh, you serve the jail time and you still think you're guilty and you go to prison? So if you've served, so your jail time is unlimited until the jury decides whether or not you're going to jail. Okay. So if the jury finds you not guilty, you're released that day. If the jury finds you guilty, then you're moved, remanded straight to prison right away. Okay. So that's kind of the world you're in. Which is part of why a lot of people get bailed out. They get, they get bailed out because the trial goes on for a long time and they don't, if they don't think they're guilty, they're like, why do I want to be in jail for all this time? So prison is forever. Like prison is however long, you know, so if you have a life sentence in prison, you're in prison for the rest of your life. So, oh, so you can get out of prison. Mm -hmm. A lot of people do. So, I mean, you think about, like, what if somebody gets charged with, like, a violent felony, and that violent felony is, uh, like, armed robbery. They're probably not going to jail for the rest of their lives. They're going to go maybe for 15, 20 years. Well, after those 20 years are up, they're going to leave prison, and even whether they're an adult or a child. Oh, so you're going to get extended a lot of time in prison. Mm -hmm. Until you might eventually get out of prison. Hopefully they think you've changed the way you right. And that's you know, and that becomes the goal. So let's just go over a couple little other pieces about how the trial itself works. So the prosecutor and the defendant, both of the attorneys are both sides are gonna have their attorneys and they're gonna argue. The prosecutor is not arguing for the victim. The prosecutor is arguing for the city or the state or the national government. And so it's always like when we see the shows on TV, it's the people or city or state versus the person who's being charged with the crime. And so both sides will call witnesses and have all of the bring evidence and they'll try to convict or get the person acquitted from the crime. And after the trial, then the jury is going to make the ultimate decision about guilt or innocence. So when you're convicted, you, you go to jail, right? Oh, prison. prison. To prison, yep. So when you're charged, you might stay in jail until you try? Exactly. Oh. Yep. And one thing that in the adult system we do have is all these constitutional protections. So you have the protection against self-incrimination. I, you know, the pleading the Fifth Amendment. I don't want to compete. I don't want to say these sort of things that'll hurt myself. We have the protection that you can't be succumb to unreasonable search and seizure. So if the police officer barges into somebody's house without a warrant, unannounced, and finds evidence of wrongdoing, that's not going to be allowed in a trial. If an individual is punished, then you can't have cruel and unusual punishment. These are all constitutional uh, protections that we have. And there's also the right to have a jury trial, the right to a speedy jury trial, 
and the right to see the witness who's testifying against you. These are all constitutional protections that the adult system has. So a speed trial is trial right away? It's a trial in a reasonable time. The Supreme Court has defined speedy trial to mean that you can't have somebody sit in jail for like 25 years before you actually bring them to trial. trial yeah. You have to have the trial and decide whether they have to go to prison or not. And then no, no, let them go. No, no longer than a year? Yeah, a year is, I think a year is probably about, if unless you can tell a really good story about, oh, this is, it's really hard to find the evidence. Maybe it was like an arson and the person like burned their house down at the last, when they were being arrested or something. So let's talk about the purposes of prison, and we talked a little bit about this the other day. There tends to be four main purposes that people see in prisons. The first is just to punish people who do bad things. And so the people who take the punishment prison approach literally think that it doesn't really matter why the person, what we're doing with the person once they're inside. The whole purpose of having a prison system is to say, look, you crossed this line, you broke a law, and so now you're going to go to jail because that's just the punishment that you get. And the goal is not to try to change their attitude or their minds. Even though there's other arguments those people might take, that that attitude is just the whole purpose of jail is punishment. Second is the group of people who think that jail is to deter wrongdoing. And so this is saying that, look, jail is somewhere that you and I don't want to be. And so if we say, if you drive drunk, you're going to go to jail, then hopefully we're encouraging people not to drive drunk. Exactly. And so it's just an incentive story. And so there's that kind of purpose of prison. So we've got the punishment, we have the deterrence group. The third group is to protect the population. Some people will say, look, this guy raped someone. We think that this person is going to potentially rape someone else, or this person murdered someone, we're worried they're going to murder someone else, or this is a gang member who has you know, dealt drugs in this neighborhood and these kids have gotten hurt and we think he's going to do it somewhere else. In order to try to protect the rest of society, we say, let's put this person in prison so that they can't hurt somebody else in the future. That may not hurt people in jail, but we tend to feel like, oh, we're more concerned about all the people who are outside of jail and protecting them. And then the last purpose is rehabilitation. And a lot of people see the, per the point of prison as being somewhere where someone can go, have time to think about what they did wrong, and then ultimately to make a decision that they don't want to repeat those types of actions. And so sometimes they need to get psychological help. Yeah. Sometimes they need other types of help to try to figure out how do I avoid having these kind of reactions or taking these same sort of harmful steps to me and to other people when I get out of prison. Okay. And so those kind of are four different things. And the purpose of prison is a lot of times going to affect our view on how juveniles are going to be treated in the criminal justice system. Because if we really think that hope the only purpose of the adult criminal justice system is to punish, then we're probably going to be less prone to thinking that juveniles charged with violent felonies ought to be put there. Whereas if we think there's some rehabilitation, maybe some protection, and even some incentive effects, especially the incentive sometimes is the story that people use to say, look, if the punishment is really big, juveniles are going to think twice because they don't want to go to jail for 40 years. Mm -hmm. They have their lives to live, and so this could actually help them because it's going to create this incentive. And there's a lot of good research out there on both sides that says, yes, all these punishments deter crime, or no, all this punishment doesn't. And it's not clear what the answer is, but that's good because we have to debate both sides. Mm -hmm. So last, let's just talk about the juvenile system. So the juvenile system, the main focus is rehabilitation. The juvenile justice system tends to focus mostly on rehabilitation. It has some of the other purposes, but mostly rehabilitation. And the goal is to helping an individual see the error of their ways while they're still young so that they can kind of lead productive lives later on. But one of the important things to remember is in the juvenile system, a lot of those constitutional protections, so the right to uh, confront your witnesses and a speedy trial, a jury trial, a lot of those protections don't exist in the juvenile system because the judge is given a lot more power because the judge is going to try to make a decision about how long sentences should be, whether or not this juvenile should go to a halfway house, and all these sorts of things. But there's some trade-offs on the constitutional protections. So that could be a really interesting reason that maybe to try to support the Constitution, we're going to give them that opportunity.